through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 218. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today we're going to be talking about a great actor who we yes. haven't talked a lot about before and who actually I feel like kind of gets overlooked a lot. Very much so. Forrest Whitaker. Yes. This Friday the 4th he has A Dark Truth coming out. Yes. Probably not a good sign that's coming out in January, but you know, <laughs> yeah. we'll, give, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt since he's done a lot of great work over time. Yes. Specifically in Vietnam, so you know, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that a few times. But the first one we really want to talk about is... A very light-hearted film, mm -hmm. and that's Fast Times at Ridgemont High, yes. from director Amy Heckerling of Clueless fame. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. This is the story of a group of teenagers in California who, you know, have hijinks while they're in mm -hmm. high school. It's it's funny to think back about this film because, it, I mean, it is a comedy, but at the heart of this film is Sean Penn. Yes. And Sean Penn, at this point in his career, is very... Not comedic, correct. So it's 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 so funny to look back on him as Spicoli because that's <laughs> such a like classic uh, character in yeah. the film. Yeah, really, and really uh, outside, like you said, outside almost anything else he's ever done. I mean, like, yeah, I don't think he ever really went back to that well to retap it. He kind of did the opposite, where he went very very far yeah, he, away. Yeah, he very Spicoli. much went into the serious dramatic mm -hmm. film acting, and that worked out well for him. I mean, you know, a couple Academy Awards, I believe, at this point. Yeah. So I mean, you can't really blame him for that. But you know, something I never realized about this film, written by Cameron Crowe. Yeah, I noticed that too. And he was actually nominated for a Writers Guild award for it. Interesting. Sadly, uh, there's a lot of references to rock and roll in mm -hmm. the movie, mm -hmm. which makes sense if you think about Cameron. Uh, yeah, Crow. exactly, because he was a Rolling Stone writer. <laughs> yep, almost Obviously famous, being based on him, yep, very and much based. directed by him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's it's it's this was a film that got a like a great start for a lot of people. You think back about the cast of people. I mean, you had like Judge mm -hmm. Ryan, Phoebe Jeff, Cates, Phoebe Cates, Jennifer Jason Lee, Amanda Wiss, mm -hmm. uh, who we actually interviewed on this very podcast. It's uh, Nicholas Cage's first acting role. Mm -hmm. He was actually going to be Judge Reinhold's character until they found out that he was 17 at the time, not mm -hmm. 18. So they couldn't actually use him for that role and they, he ended up getting a... There's actually, interestingly enough, this movie, unlike almost any high school movie that is made today, actually had people close to the age because there was a lot of the things in the film mm -hmm. that they couldn't do because they had underage actors. So they had to wait till like certain hours right. or they had to get certain per like permission to do and well, maybe that speaks to what happened with Clueless, where you had people like Stacey Dash, who were like 30 years old, yes. playing teenagers. Paul Rudd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, You had all these people who are clearly not mm -hmm. teenagers involved. Well, I know in Paul film. Rudd's not supposed to be a teenager in the movie, just for to, be, to clarify. Dash. Stacey Dash, I believe, was in her 30s when yeah. Clueless was made, which is, <laughs> I mean, speaks to how well she looked for her yeah. age, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's a little crazy. You know, also, you got to say, Force Whitaker's role in this film was, again, much like Nicolas Cage, a very early start where he plays, like, the jock mm -hmm. who who is their star football player who yes. Spicoli steals his car, wrecks it, and he sort of frames their rival school to That's sort of right, get yes. out of being in trouble, which <laughs> inspires Forrest Whitaker to lead them to victory. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a small role for sure, but it's it's definitely, I mean... At, at that, I mean, realistically speaking, in hindsight, every role in Fast Times seems like a small role except yeah. for Spicoli, and they all, almost all went somewhere. So mm -hmm. even yeah, having a small role, still iconic. Yeah. No, I also think it's weird that something I never fully realized is, you know, Judge Reinhold's famous masturbation scene. Mm. Uh, he actually bought and brought to set, without telling anyone, a very large dildo to simulate that. And so Phoebe Cates actually didn't know. And so her look of like horror and disgust it's when she real. opened the store is very real. That's awesome. Because that's what's right below the cutoff screen is a yeah. very large, hopefully multicolored uh, dildo. Well, well, do, well done, Judge Ryan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> way, to, way to fully get into that yeah. scene. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's it's funny that think about this movie in the context of where we're going with his career yes. because you know it was just a few years later he was one of the stars of Platoon, mm -hmm. the Oliver Stone Vietnam classic yes. about the horrors of war. You mm -hmm. know, um, story of a young soldier Charlie Sheen who heads over there who discovers you know the brutality of war yes. behind the scenes and how even Very you know realistic depiction of realistic Vietnam, depiction but it's also Vietnam you know war. like it's it's not you're not just fighting the enemy there's yes. you're fighting within because sure. there are people who are 
I don't know what you call sadists. Um, yeah, this is this is definitely much more about the horrors of being in war rather than the horrors of war. It's mm-hmm. less about the conflict and yeah. more about just being a soldier in a horrible war. Yeah, I mean, it also speaks to you know how terrifying it would be to be in a war where you're not just fighting outside, you're fighting yes. within. I mean, you got was it Tom Berenger uh-huh. was you know the leader of the platoon yes. essentially, and he. Gets a little dark. Well, he, he's brutal. Like he just, yeah. I mean, there's this whole thing about just killing civilians, mm-hmm. essentially, and you he know, doesn't care. He gives zero it, fucks. Well, it's it's just like that. But like you know, when this sort of information starts to come out, like it, it, his anger then turns to his own people. If mm-hmm. anyone's going to betray him, you know, yes. they become targets of his mm-hmm. war path, if you will say. I mean, it's it's interesting to see how war twists everyone's sort of yes. perceptions and behavior. And I mean. It's funny to think about. Force Whitaker is actually one of these sort of more sympathetic characters mm-hmm. in the movie as as the medic of the group. And you yes. know, he, I mean, he's An empathetic character. I mean, it, I mean, he he actually is not just an animal in terms Correct. of like his treatment of everyone else. Yes. And it's 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 really interesting to think about how war does influence everyone's actions and sort of... Yeah, um, Oliver Stone put, like, all the actors through a pretty intensive boot camp right before this. Like, I think it was, like, 28 days... Or not 28 days, um, it was, like, some number of weeks, I want to say. Uh, in that time, Tom Berenger lost 28 pounds. But wow. they And they started filming the day after they were done because he didn't want any of the actors. He wanted... He didn't want it to to give them like authentic war feel he actually wanted them to be worn out ragged and like d- defeated looking so they started filming right afterwards so that they all could show this effect interestingly enough also this whole film is shot sequentially interesting so charlie sheen's emotion when they're leaving at the very end is actually when they physically left Thailand, which is where they were shooting the film. It, so also, it also makes sense about, you know, if he's that thorough about wanting to wear people down right yes. up until filming, it sort of would continue that mm-hmm. methodology along that you're you're most worn out at the very end yep. of the film, at the end of the story, and you know... Will, it, Willem Dafoe's famous final scene, mm-hmm. uh, originally there was a bunch of squibs that were supposed to go off on him, but they didn't go off. But that first take, Willem Dafoe's like, acting for it was so dramatic that they kept it. It's it's a great scene. There's like I mean, a lot more fake blood that was supposed I mean, to go off. Explains why he was nominated for supporting yeah. actor. Berenger was nominated for supporting actor. I mean, both f- both cast against type. Normally, before this, Tom Berenger was nothing but heroes, and uh, Willem Dafoe was mostly villains. And, and they pretty much reverted mm-hmm. to that afterwards. Well, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. But you know, it's, I mean, it won best picture. It mm-hmm. won what's the best uh, director. It, it's I mean, a beloved film for sure. And which is which is uh, I think an important point to note. Which I think not only is what makes the movie so impactful, but also is an interesting note for Oliver Stone's career. Uh, Oliver Stone was the first Vietnam vet to direct a major motion picture right. about Vietnam. Uh, he was already the first Vietnam vet to win an Oscar for Midnight Express, mm. uh, which he still holds, and became, the, with this picture, the first Vietnam vet to win an Oscar for Best Director. I mean, it, def- it definitely adds an element of authenticity for somebody who was actually there and experienced mm-hmm. like the horrors of war to yeah. do this. I mean, he's an and amazing, amazing talent. I think, like, as, his, as of 2010, he's the last veteran of any war to win an Oscar for Best Picture, wow. other than Clint Eastwood. Who served in the army during the Korean War, but never actually went to Korea. Yeah, yeah, it's still impressive. I guess yeah. we'll give him we'll give him points. I think it's it. an impressive because I never thought about that really much when you think about the authenticity of Platoon, but you no, realize totally. he was there. I mean, most of it's about his experiences. I mean, it works out well for Forrest Whitaker because then he carries this over the next year into Good, Good Morning, Morning Vietnam, Vietnam. Mm-hmm. which, in some ways, is a different movie, and in some ways, is a similar film. I mean, <laughs> he has a much bigger role. Number yes. one, he sort of is the main friend of mm-hmm. Robin Williams, who's a DJ brought to Vietnam to sort of entertain the troops. Yes. And along the way, he sort of befriends, or he pursues this woman. He befriends mm-hmm. her brother. Turns out the brother is... Um, a Viet Cong yes. soldier, or, and you know all sorts of like deception and uh, complications. Complications arise. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it sort of starts out light as he's sort of like this lively DJ mm-hmm. who's sort Very of like Robin try- Williamsy. Yeah, he's going against what you know army 
protocol mm-hmm. is for DJ, and he's doing more sort of his idea of what people want to hear. Yeah. And I mean, they do. They 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 love him for it. But you know. He has to witness, you know, bombings that kill people. He has to be, you know, like, he's chased by, or his, his truck, or was mm-hmm. the truck blow, is blown up? I think up, so, yeah. It's and he has to hide with Force Wicker in the, like, the woods or mm-hmm. whatever. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that wears down on him and as he sort of sees the horrors of war. I mean, finally he's driven out of there and he sort of tries to maintain some semblance of, like, supporting mm-hmm. his, his friends, you know, people like Force Whitaker and the other soldiers. But ultimately he is, I mean, pushed out. Yes. And, it, I mean, it's not a happy ending, Mm-mm. for sure, much like the Vietnam War. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much excommunicated, might as well, almost. Yeah, totally. I mean... I think it's interesting that uh, this is one of those films that was based on a true story but was very much tweaked mm. from the true story. I think um, Robin Williams ad-libbed all of Adrian Cronauer's broadcasts. Which so. makes total sense. And it's totally in fits, Robin Williams' yeah, style. It, it like, him. Yeah, actual, in, in reality, Adrian Cronauer said that his character is about 45% accurate. He's actually like a very staunch Republican, <laughs> uh, was su- very supportive of Dick Cheney, uh, was not as much humorous as he was saying what he wanted to say which right. was against the grain right. and it was more about that in in the the fact side of it but you know it's i think that message still gets across pretty important in the film because i think rob williams zaniness is merely the taste we get of him going against the grain. I think if that was political, that would it would have the similar sure, vein. Sure, sure. I mean, and, and Forrest Whitaker plays an important role because mm-hmm. he's sort of the successor to Robin yes, Williams. I mean, he's right. the one who plays Robin Williams' tape at the end. Mm-hmm. He sort of takes over the radio show. Mm-hmm. I mean, he has to experience... I mean, he was there before Robin Williams. Yeah. There, so he knows about the war, but he has to experience a lot of these experiences with Robin Williams. And, you know, he... he def- I mean, they definitely bond as friends. Yeah. And he's probably the most... Uh, reminiscent of him going mm-hmm. forward in the war, and you know, presumably the same thing will happen to him at Probably. some point going forward. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's a great <laughs> film. Uh, Robin Williams is actually nominated for an Academy Award for that interesting. role. Interesting. Lost to Michael Douglas for Wall Street for Best Actor, okay. which is kind of interesting because I don't know if I necessarily, th- I mean, obviously, I think Michael Douglas was great in Wall Street, but yeah. I don't know if I necessarily think of Gordon Gecko as a lead mm, actor. Like, he feels yeah. more like a supporting character. It feels like that's really more yeah. Charlie Sheen's movie, but, you know, he was so good in it, I guess. They're just like, we want to give him... It's true, and I and I bet I wouldn't be surprised if that movie had, like, somehow been made slightly later in Charlie Sheen's career that Charlie Sheen would have been considered the best actor because he was still yeah. relatively... I mean, yeah. I mean, he was doing stuff at this time, but he was still relatively young in the acting game, so... Totally. Yeah, no doubt. And it also is worth noting that Though he lost the Academy Award, he did win the Golden Globe for uh, musical or comedy, which seems kind of okay, but at the same time, kind of not. I mean, there is comedy in here, but it's yeah. also a lot darker than you think of when you yeah. think of most comedies. But I guess I can I can see that based on essentially the fact that he ad libbed most of it, saying, "Hey, good job at ad libbing yeah. funny stuff." Sure, but I mean, like, as the film goes on, it's no, like less about yeah, yeah. comedy and more. I would about say, the film. yeah, like his. I would say it's easier to say he was a comedic actor than the film was comedic. Yeah, I guess so. I could sort of see that. Gotta give props to Barry Levinson too. Uh huh. He directed this. He did, you know, Diana Rain Man, The Natural, Sleepers, Wag the Dog, Sphere. Mm-hmm. But he also Sphere. did Ooh. Bandits and Envy. So mm. kind of a declining little slope there. It's for Envy, him as that well. Jack Black, uh, Ben Stiller one. Yeah. yeah. His 80s were great. Some of the 90s were pretty good, too. But uh, thereafter, it's a little bit uh, more sketch yeah. than it. But uh, moving right along, another acclaimed film that featured Forrest Whitaker, sadly, in a smaller role was... Unfortunately. The Crying Game. Yes. This is the story of the IRA mm-hmm. and British conflict in the... I guess it was sort of the early 90s. But Yeah, I think so. Essentially... This, the Force Whitaker's part is as a British soldier who's captured yes. by the IRA. He's the hostage. He's the hostage. He befriends Stephen Rhea, mm-hmm. who is his guard essentially, yeah, and basically, he learns about Force Whitaker's girlfriend, mm-hmm. who sounds so intriguing to mm-hmm. him that after Force Whitaker dies, well, I think he also asks him. He says, "Like I know I'm not going to live yeah, through this. Yeah. Could oh, yeah. you check in on right. my girlfriend, make but sure she's when, still okay?" When Force Whitaker's death occurs, through yes. Um, a series of bad events like A, he, they tell Sinria to kill him. Mm-hmm. He can't do it, so essentially Force Whitaker's running away. Yes. He gets hit by like a British convoy, <laughs> which then 
blows up the safe house. So he's sort of running from the IRA, uh -huh. and he, he also kind of wants to deliver this message. Yes. So he goes under a suit, uh, uh, not a pseudonym, because that's something else. But he, I guess pseudonym's right. Yeah. I mean, he uses Fake a name. different identity yeah. to sort of go to England mm -hmm. and sort of befriend Dill, played by Jay Davidson. Jay Davidson, yeah, mm -hmm. who was actually nominated for a supporting award for this. Mm -hmm. um, and along the way, has a I mean, I don't know how much we want to spoil for. I mean, turns out she's a man. Yeah, like, I mean, the, it's it, it's like it's it's even more than the sixth sense as far as everyone's talked about the spoiler of this film. Like, even though at the time, yeah. I think early critics said that the twist of the film was gonna shock, make people not want to see it. It actually drew more people to it. Because I well, I think that they even say that like in the trailer at some point they're like, "Don't spoil it." Probably or something like that. There's probably Ever a wait TV for the spot twist that or did something. That, yeah. I remember something like that. There was some early reviewer that actually uh, spoiled it based on the first uh, letter in each line in their uh, article. Oh, said he is a she. Was the well, I, guess, I mean if he's if creative seen, enough to do it. If you've seen Ace Ventura, you know the the premise of the crying game because when it's, Einhorn turns out to be a man, that yeah. whole scene is a tribute Isn't it to Finkel as Einhorn. Yeah, Einhorn or yeah. Finkel, whatever. He's crying in the shower and scrubbing his tongue. Yeah, I mean, this is a great film though. Uh, really interesting film about personality and identity because it's like a combination of like a romance and a political. Yeah, tale no, at totally. the same I mean, time. You got the, the British Neil versus Jordan's, IRA. Yeah. Neil Jordan's really great with this. It's interestingly enough that originally he had I forget what the name was originally for the movie, but he had some name that had um, a religious connotation to mm. it, and um, um, why well, can't I remember Kubrick? Stanley Kubrick actually said to Neil Jordan, "Don't do that. If you if you make put that kind of insinuation in your title, people won't see it." And I guess like. He, Neil Jordan had had two previous movies that had names like something of angels and something else mm. that have both been flops, so he changed it to. I mean, I think you got to note that given the time period, this is like '92. This mm -hmm. is right around the same time Philadelphia was coming yep. out. So like political correctness was political, starting to well, peak its head. I, well, it's not even just that. It's just sort of like the the notion of doing a gay relationship as the core of a movie uh -huh. was really progressive. Yes, and to sort of. Um, Treat it as, you know... Treat it relatively normal. Well, also make it, you know, at the end, it's, it's like once the, the secret is revealed, there's yes. still, like, love beyond mm -hmm. gender. It's 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 that love supersedes gender, whatever you yeah. want to say. And to do this that early in the 90s, right, you know, when I think um, AIDS was still mm -hmm. very much a scary thing and, you know, there's a lot of homophobia yeah, in I mean, the U.S. still going on. It's a very progressive And, concept. I mean, you just add on top of that a, an IRA agent whose loyalty with his own, not only the IRA, IRA, but his conflict against the British. I mean, the Irish and British have yeah. quite a history, so yeah. all that, like, your own people are after you, your own historical uh, narrative is screwed up, your own sexuality is screwed up, you were helping this person that's supposed to be the enemy, and now, you know, like, yeah, there's so much like... identity issues in the movie that are really interesting. I also think it's saying, kind of going to your thing about the time frame and the world, so, you know, nowadays... Like, this would never happen, but check this out. So a few weeks into filming, Jay Davidson, playing Dill, got ill. And so a doctor called, was called on the set to look at him. A uh, doctor entered Jay's tiny trailer, examined him, and came out to talk to the director, Neil Jordan. Mm. The doctor asked Neil, have you considered the possibility that she might be pregnant? That's awesome. Uh, to which Neil and the other crew obviously were um, laughed. The doctor was amused, and then when they told him, he was felt really, really foolish. But I mean, like that's the kind of world that '92 was closer to, where yeah. a doctor could do an examination of a patient and not know the gender based on making assumptions and trying to stay out of people, like you know. I mean, I, I, the... You also wonder if like Jay was sort of like playing it up. Sort of, you know, method acting. Yeah, it's, sort of, it's hard know. to know. I mean, they they work. They search pretty hard, uh, high and low, for a character, someone to play this. I think that she was, he was found in a bar, right? And, like, and I mean, Jay really had two sort of noteworthy yep. films. This and Stargate, yep, and then sort of essentially raw. vanished. Like mm -hmm. as far as I know, Roe hasn't done any of major. But I mean, after Stargate and Crying Game, do you really need anything else? I don't know. Pretty it's, successful there's, movies. There's a couple of things also note. Uh, number one, you know, Neil Jordan, you mentioned, it's done some interesting stuff. It did Interview with the Vampire. Yes, that's right. Did the Brave one most recently with. Um, is it uh, Jodie Foster? Oh, okay, yes. But also did, you know, Breakfast on Pluto, which 
had uh, was it Cill- Killian Murphy in Survey Transgender okay. Girls, so sort of revisiting that well later. And so perhaps it's something that's just of interest mm-hmm. to Neil Jordan. I mean, yeah. he's definitely interested in discussing sexuality because obviously vampires are something mm-hmm. that very much tackle that idea. Yeah. And you know, um, also very very a uh, lot of nominations of the Academy mm-hmm. Awards. It, got, it won Best Writing for the Screen, but sadly awesome. this occurred at a period, you know, you think of this sort of as like uh, there will be blood okay. to a no country for old men. Okay. Same time as uh, Unforgiven, so it lost oh. that it, for Best Picture, uh, lost Best Supporting Actor to Gene Hackman, lost Best Director to Clint Eastwood. Steven Rio was nominated for Best Actor, wow! But he lost to Al Pacino for *Scent of a Woman*, Ooh. so that was also. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, man, talk about a tough cards stacked against yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> t- tough time to come out, but you know, yeah. a very, a very uh, well-respected film mm-hmm. for sure. Also, continuing on the sort of uh, path, but from a different perspective, *Blown Away*. Yes, this is the classic for me, at least. I love this film. I do too. Uh, about a bomb diffuser was mm-hmm. a. Do they have bomb squad, bomb squad guy who goes up against a former friend slash fellow um, IRA mm-hmm. um, member, played by Tommy Wiseau. So expert. essentially, it, the lead is Jeff Bridges, who's yes, a former right. IRA member who's mm-hmm. fled to the U.S. and become adopted yeah. a new identity, become a bomb squad guy after the horrors of mm-hmm. what they're doing over there. Uh, sort of forced him to try and stop his colleague, mm-hmm. Tommy Lee Jones. Yes. Through accidents, Tommy Lee Jones is arrested. I believe his sister slash love dies. And so Tommy Lee Jones essentially wants revenge yeah, upon revenge. Jeff Bridges. Obviously, he does bombings mm-hmm. in, was it Boston, I believe? Yes, Boston. Um, it's, it's a very tense film. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. it's sort of like, in some ways, a, a sort of, T- slightly toned down version of the Hurt Locker mm. where there's a lot of tension sort of what's who's going to die mm-hmm. where's he going to strike next definitely um, who's going to make out of this film I remember even the trailer for this film back in the day being intense yeah, it was, it was counting down lots of explosions tense sweaty people I mean you have also Forrest Whitaker playing his uh Bombs God qual- mm-hmm. colleague, uh, who's a rookie, yes. yeah, who is suspicious of the relationship between Jeff Bridges mm-hmm. and Tommy Lee Jones as they sort of go back and forth, you know, sort of um, as opposing mm-hmm. forces who seem to know each other yes. and eventually figures know a out a little bit too much about each uh, other. <laughs> figures out what's going on, uh, sort of blackmails Jeff Bridges into. Uh, giving him the credit Mm -hmm. so it'll save him as long as he gives him the credit and you know ultimately at that point you know once this family is safe I don't think he really cares but it's 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 really interesting to sort of have that um, back and forth between Jeff Bridges and Tommy when you already have such a, a tense foreground story of a demolitions expert and a bomb squad team member basically squaring off in a populated city yeah. to add the fact that they have weird back backstory. And this history. is one. This is one of the first times I remember. I mean, you, again, you have that sort of political backstory mm-hmm. uh, going on as well. But you also, this is one of the first times I remember like bomb squad really being mm-hmm. a premise for film. Yeah, like, and yeah. they, man, they did so much demolitions in this movie. Like, in fact, the ocean liner that they blow up mm-hmm. in the in the. East Boston Bay, I believe. Uh, the shockwave from that blew out 8,000 windows in East wow. Boston because it was an actual explosion. Wow. That's cool. <laughs> I love the, some of the, It's so weird to think back on these things and realize how much that stuff doesn't happen anymore. Like, if we think about it, Christopher Nolan blowing up that huge hospital in The Dark Knight Rise, mm. in The Dark Knight, might be one of the last huge like demolition style things in movies because most of those things don't happen anymore. They're either simulated or done with miniatures or done with special effects. It's true. It's It's rare anymore that we buy old buildings and blow them up just for the sense of a movie or in the sense of Gone with the Wind record Warner Brothers Studios burning down. I mean, I think it, it, it's just sort of sad to me that this film did not get more acclaim. Oh, I, I know. Mean, it was, I thought it was a lot of fun, but it really was nominated for nothing. Like, nothing. The only things it was nominated for was, like, Best Villain at the MTV Awards. Which Tommy Lee Jones was great. He so. was great, but he didn't even win. He lost to Dennis Hopper for Speed. Which, uh. granted, is a good villain, too. And there's got, there's got a little no. bit of bomb action going on there as no. well. I think, I think he's a great villain. I am not 
a speed apologist, unlike the rest of the MacGuffin. Yeah, I am very uh, much anti-speed. Anti-speedite. I, I think I think Daz Hopper's very good in speed, and but you know I think Tommy Lee Jones is great in this. So pop quiz, hot shot. It's a very iconic thing. Very iconic. Yeah, there's a lot of iconic bad movie lines that we can yeah. all remember. <laughs> I disagree on that one, but let's move right along. Moving right along to a more um, sympathetic character, mm -hmm. perhaps. We're talking 1996's Phenomenon. Mm -hmm. This is the John... Phenomenon. Phenomenon. <laughs> Phenomenon. Oh. Uh, this is the John Travolta classic about a man who suddenly is bestowed uh, incredible in intelligence. Incredible yeah. intelligence after seeing a light in the sky. Mm -hmm. and sort of like what exactly occurred to him. Yes. Where did this come from? He's able to like learn languages mm -hmm. in Super a couple fast, of hours. Yeah. He's able to do all sorts of scientific things. He decodes um, some Morse code signals, yes. which ultimately re have re <laughs> lead the army to arresting <laughs> him and his best friend, played by Force, Force Whitaker. Whitaker. Yep. Um, Nate, I believe his character. Yes, name. Nate. It's. I mean, it's sort of an interesting story about you know what you do if you're suddenly stricken with supreme intelligence and sort of like what the consequences of that mm -hmm. are as like the government becomes yeah. obsessed with sort of capturing him and they want to dissect his brain. Just like every, we all assume would happen realistically if there was ever a superhero is but that the how, government would want to capture him and dissect I mean, their brain. Which is why I love the new <laughs> Superman trailer because they mm. put him in shackles. I mean it's yeah, absurd that they Unless they're, they're made like, out of kryptonite they're yeah. completely useless. I mean they're completely but. useless but that's what they would do. I mean if there was somebody who could actually fly and true, yeah. could you know withstand bullets and like what you, you, people would be freaked out. Yeah, this is sort true. of similar to this. This is a guy who was able to crack a mm -hmm. governmental code. And it's like a nobody in the middle of nowhere. Seemingly. Yeah. They don't understand. I mean, they, but they actually want to kill him while he's still alive to mm -hmm. dissect mm -hmm. his brain while it's like fresh instead of waiting. Like, that's how paranoid they are about it. It's like him. E.T. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting film. I mean, it really, I mean, when they sort of take the twist and disclose that it's caused by a tumor on his yes, brain that's like right. it's sort of like a sad spin on it <laughs> but i mean it's still a very interesting film mm -hmm. and with the exception of like the governmental people like everyone's pretty much sympathetic characters which mm -hmm. i actually like i like yes nice people most people you know um need conflict in their movies and i actually like a, just a nice story every now and that then. That gets sad in the end and you want to cry? Yeah. No. A little cry. A no. little tear. Crying never hurt anybody. But it, I mean, Sing, single force Whitaker tear? Exactly, yeah. It, it's it's just really interesting, I mean, just to see um, where, like, suddenly this takes this mm -hmm. normal what man. One, what one would do and how the world would react to makes it. Makes you think of what you'd do. I, I would not tell the government. That's I would tell, I totally go all Lex Luthor, take over the world. <laughs> it's totally true. I go a uh, brain. Of Pinky and the Brain. You could be Pinky. I'll Thanks. be the Brain. Thanks. Thanks for keeping that job up. One is a genius, the other's insane. Yeah. I guess that's not bad. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's a decent film. Sort of um, oft forgotten, I would say. Mm. Oh, yeah. And it got to give a note that it was directed by John Turtletub, oh, wow. who went on to direct the National Treasure movies, which I do enjoy. I'm in the minority that defends you them. You are indeed. And actually, will defend Sorcerer's Apprentice. I think it's better than most that's people actually get actually not a bad movie. A lot of people shit on it but it's mm -hmm. actually it's actually a fairly fun film i mean yeah you know it's not too bad yeah it needs more jay bear show and less nick cage but yes. that's kind of my opinion in yes. most things so uh, again you know this is a film that was forgotten mm -hmm. largely by award shows it was nominated for mtv awards where uh travolta lost best male performance to tom cruise for jerry Maguire, which i can respect but you know it's sort of a special yeah. scientology edition of the mtv <laughs> <laughs> movie awards, but yeah. Speaking of Scientology, we will glaze over Battlefield Earth. Yes. Because yes. Intentionally. <laughs> yes. But I mean, so we would like to talk about why Forrest Whitaker is awesome rather yes. than... Yes. I mean, for a lot of his career, he's been sort of stuck in smaller Bit secondary parts, roles, yeah. but he really got his chance to yes. shine uh, back in, was it 2006, in The Last King of Scotland. Mm -hmm. This is the story of a... Is it Ugandan? Yes, you, it's based on reality. It's a mm -hmm. Ugandan um, dictator or a prime he minister. Becomes, well, forget. he becomes a dictator. It's a it's a sort of a, a Ugandan president. Okay, yeah. Who, or, or a man who becomes Ugandan president yeah. during a coup, mm, and. Mm -hmm. Along the way, he sort of befriends this physician played by James McAvoy. Okay, and James McAvoy, 
here's what his beliefs are and his sort of goals for the country and he sort of um, believes him to have the best interests in hmm. the country at heart and as time goes along he becomes progressively more paranoid mm-hmm. and more insane um, I don't know if you want to call it fascist <laughs> okay but like he, he, he starts to like authoritarian close, yeah exactly authoritarian totalitarian whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it and his grip on the country becomes more and more intense like for instance he has a son who he shuns because he's epileptic hmm. um, and very when, uh, African nation type of thing yeah. to do. Find a disease well, and shut take, your people for it. Take that in the next level. Um, James McAvoy sort of befriends the wife, this one of many wives, <laughs> and they have a relationship. He impregnates her, and she needs to get an abortion because if Forrest Whitaker discovers yeah. that, she's going to be tortured. Yeah. And unfortunately, he, James McAvoy is unable to make their appointment, so she is essentially like. Tortured, Killed. yeah. Oh, I mean, wow. she she's tortured to death, and classy. Well, I mean, gradually, like it comes to light. You know, the the British. I think is the British want him to um, assassinate mm. Force Whitaker's character, and he sort of attempts to do it, but he's revealed. They torture James McAvoy. Eventually, it gets away. But like, it really is one of the most interesting sort of um, looks at the politics in Africa mm. and dictators yes. in general, just sort of that rise to power and how power corrupts and you know, even power people who might absolutely <laughs> even people who might whether you want to believe he's good or not in the yes. beginning with his intentions. But people who at least have good intentions. <laughs> yeah, like power does do crazy things to yes. people and you know, it's it's really an intense, honest look at that sort of perspective and from an outside source sort mm. of. And Forrest Whitaker did a lot of research the moment he mm. got this role he like learned to play accordion, he taught he learned Swahili, like comp- the entire language, mm. like a variety of things to get into the role of this character. And interestingly enough it's the first, I mean not surprisingly but kind of interesting, uh, it's the first western production shot in Uganda mm. since 1990 with uh, Mississippi Masala so we got. I mean, you got to note that this is a guy who went on to, I think, massacre something like three hundred thousand people during yes. his time in power. And so, again, you know, it's sort of like whatever you want to think about somebody like Fidel Castro mm-hmm. or whatever. But you know, these people who sort of lead people under a premise during their coups, who you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to talk about Fidel Castro because some <laughs> pe- some people like him, some people don't. Fair enough. But like this guy, you know, obviously went way off yes. the rails upon getting power. It's, yep. it's a really interesting, tragic story, and deservedly he won the Academy Award for yes, Best Actor did. for the role because he, I mean, he is amazing. And amazingly, this is his only Academy Award nomination ever. Really? Never nominated for anything else. Really? Yeah, that's a mm. shame. Great, great actor mm-hmm. deserves deserves a lot of credit. Yes, he does. So that brings us to this Friday, the first, or sorry, the fourth, fourth of January, yes. first Friday of January. I was going to say, mm-hmm. this is the release of a dark truth, yes. um, story of a former CIA operative slash political talk show host, played who's, by Andy Garcia. Yes, yes, who's hired to go and look at a uh, comp- a possible mass a cover up of a massacre by a company down in South America. Interesting, and he arrives to a violent chaotic situation where you know um some activists are going up against the company and sort of there's trying to do a cover-up and it's an intense situation Hmm. i think the trailer looks interesting all sort of early reports in terms of reviews have been not quite so positive Mm. and you know i mean i'm not the biggest andy garcia enthusiast he's okay yeah i mean it's got it's got people like eva longoria mm-hmm. uh kim coates who I'm oh, a fan nice. of. yeah um but you know sons of anarchy baby besides uh i mean kim coates to a certain degree and forrest whitaker and stephen bauer like it's sort of a mixed group mm-hmm. of people involved and the director damian lee it's also known for such uh classics as ski school oh yeah with uh, zach alfanakis yeah. <laughs> uh <laughs> Street law, uh, hit it. So you know, not exactly the purveyor of quality. Um, <laughs> when they when your most well known film is Ski School, yeah, 
You've been alone. Yeah. And so <laughs> sorry. To, to, I'm sorry, Mr. Lee. Yeah. But, <laughs> to put a political thriller in his uh, <laughs> yeah straight. I arms. bet I bet he was like, I can do a political thriller. Check out Ski School. I mean, well, he wrote it too. So <laughs> clearly, he was Jones to do it. You know, Ski School Two wasn't getting the green light fast enough. So so he's gonna convince the studio he can do a, a a real thinker before he goes back, taps the well again yeah, for Ski exactly. School Two. Yeah. Yeah. Still skiing. Yeah. <laughs> Ski hard. Um, <laughs> Electric my... ski blue. Yeah, that'd be good. But, you know, anyway, I'll probably check it out. You know, January is terrible for films. It so really is. If, not you, a good if time. you don't have some, you know, best picture nominees to catch up on, exactly. This, I guess this is something to watch. Or at the very least, uh, a good reason to swing by Scarecrow and get some yeah, things to rent. Watch The Last King of Scotland instead. Yeah. That'd probably be a better choice. Or even though Spencer doesn't like it, you should go on Netflix and watch Ghost Dog. Ghost Dog's okay. Like, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to, like, praise it or anything. It's okay. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I just it, like throwing you under the bus right do. at the end. Right at the end there. You do me good. Right at the end. Do a very good job of it. <laughs> but join us next time for our DVD rundown for the week of January 8th. Mm-hmm. As always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number, 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes. We're, we're on blip.tv. Mm-hmm. Miro. Roku. Check in at getglue.com. Get badges or whatever you get mm-hmm. there. Post whatever it is that Get Glue gives you. I don't know. Do you get money in the mail? Do you just get some glue in an envelope? Well, Maybe we'll reward sticky. you if you tell us that you're checking in. <laughs> we will, I swear. I'm yeah, yeah, you'll get something from us. No. Not from Get Glue. We made it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 And we'll see you next time. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.